20 years in Force Recon, Marine Special Operations Command or MARSOC, Master Sergeant of Marines, entrepreneur, firearms instructor, all around patriot of this country. These are just a few things that you're going to learn about from our good friend, Master Sergeant Ron Holmes. So stand up, hook up, and shuffle to the door. Roll that intro. You will treat all Marines with the highest level of respect, for we have earned our place as Marines and will accept nothing less than that from you. This is my rifle. There are many like it, but this one is mine. My rifle is my best friend. It is my life. I must master it as I must master my life. Without me, my rifle is useless. Without my rifle, I am useless. What is going on, all my crayon eaters out there? It is time for another episode of the Jarhead Podcast. Before we get going, introduce our guests. There are a couple things that I do want to square away with you right now. If you're out there and you're a veteran and you're in that dark place, you're in that hole, and you don't think that there's any way out of it and you can't find the light, first of all, call me, email me, text me 24-7. I can't give you medical advice, but I sure as hell can maybe be a good shoulder and definitely a good ear to talk you through some stuff. If you're looking for some really good medical advice or places to go, please, please, please understand two things. One, you're not alone. Two, the world is a much better place with you in it. So please contact the Veteran Crisis Hotline at 1-800-273-8255. Once again, 1-800-273-8255, the Veteran Crisis Hotline. Understand you've got a lot of brothers out here that are willing to help. So uh, we've got that out of the way. If you're interested in learning, to, uh, learning more about what it takes to earn the title of United States Marine, please check out the website, www.marines.com. So we've we've got on a, a good buddy of ours. Uh, we met, I don't know, a year or two ago, whenever it was. We met at, at uh, the SIG Range Day for SHOT Show out in Vegas. And uh, we introduced by a mutual friend, kind of start talking, and it winds up being that we were in kind of sister uh, units there for a while, and I was way back. I wasn't in as long as he was. We start talking. Next thing we know, we're good friends. He's been on the podcast a lot. Uh, he's he's an awesome dude. He really is. He's got some cool stuff. But um, we're gonna bring in Top Holmes, and, and he's Ron. But he's he's Master Sergeant. He's earned that 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 title of Master Sergeant. So what's up, Top? How you doing, man? Hey, how are you? I'm uh, dude. I, I like the new format. I think this is cool. And um, thanks for uh, reaching out and asking me to be on. Yeah, you know, it's been a while. I know you've been out for, what, 11 years now, so you probably don't get called top very often, but I had to do it one last time. Um, you know, when you, when you earn when you earn Master Sergeant rank, people don't realize that E8 is uh, – there's, there's two different ways that you can go once you reach E7. If you're going to go to E8, you're either going to go a command route or stay in your, your MOS. And the first sar Sergeant Major, that's for the political guys. Then you've got Master Sergeant and Master Guns. You can split. You decide to stay with your guys and kind of be that expert in your field, and I love that. You're staying with the guys and not worrying about command. Uh, before we get going to the questions, how hard was that decision of deciding which way to go? Well, it's uh, it's actually a uh, an interesting story on that. Um, I was actually stationed. I was an I and I uh, got my dream assignment. I was stationed in Anchorage, Alaska, uh, Echo Company Fourth Reconnaissance Battalion. So I got to go up there and uh, train train the the Alaskan Marines. Uh, you know, cold weather communication reconnaissance, deep reconnaissance. You know, patrols uh, on skis in the snow, stuff like that, and then also enhance my skills. Um, but uh, I was staff sergeant when I got up there. And um, there's a lot of bad, the, the good out of the bad. Um, our first sergeant got relieved. It was allowed to, and was allowed to retire. And that's a whole that I don't really want any moving on. But um, yeah. so that being said, I was Gunny Select, and um, I was appointed by the battalion, which is down in San Antonio, by the colonel and the sergeant major to be the acting first sergeant. So I, because I was going to select and I'm now into that position, I got frocked 
to Gunny. Um, nice. Ten months early, I think. You know, it was cool. I mean, you know, you don't, you know, when you get frock, you don't get the pay. You just get a new yeah. ID card. But um, it, and I and I I don't know if it affected my date of rank or whatever. Like I don't think it did. I don't know. Anyway, um, so that time frame, I think I was acting first sergeant for almost two years before they had sent a actual first sergeant up there, and and it might not have been two years. It might have been just like a year and a half. But um, that right then was when I had to make that first that first fit rep. It put FRM and I was just like, yeah, uh, no. And <laughs> I just keep, made that M. Um, it was just not, I, I, and again, I, I had the, the, the command was broken. The Marines were, um, let down, betrayed, misled, lied to, um, and abused on certain levels. And, uh, so I had a job, I had to fix it, and I did, um, and I did it my way. And I also learned along the way that I w- it was I was able to tolerate it because I was in Alaska, and it was a reconnaissance unit. And I knew that if I became a first sergeant, I probably wouldn't have the good fortune of remaining in the reconnaissance community, and I would have ended up at like a motor transport battalion, and would have been absolutely miserable. So. Yes, I wanted to stay technical. I wanted to stay in the communications field. And it actually, um, toward looking now, jump ahead to the end of my career, my last three years uh, in MARSOC, I was the G6 operations chief. And what I did, my uh, my major and I, we created the first Marine Corps Special Operations Communication School. Um, and it's, you know, so prior to retiring, it became an official C4 school recognized by uh, C and E command com- communication electronic command out 20, 29 cows, 29 palms, California. Yeah. So that was a really good, that was a good, um, I guess, uh, legacy or, you know, torch to pass. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, kind of getting back into your history and your story, uh, 20 years of the Marine Corps and, and special operations, man, that, that can take a toll on the body. We'll get to that. But, but when it comes to, Take it to the very beginning. What kind of motivated you to join the Marine Corps? Was it something you always wanted to do, or how how did you enlisting happen? So, uh, my grandfather was with Tenth Mountains in World War II, and him and his brother uh, were um, no accents, but fluent German speaking, reading, writing. Um, grew up in a, you know their their parents were German descent. Um, I'm actually, this is funny, but it's like, it's my great, great uncle's, uh, captain Van Valkenburg, captain of the Arizona. Um, so that's the lineage there. So knowing that as a kid growing up that like, that's kind of where I'm from. Um, and then hearing all, you know, my grandfather didn't really talk much about it, but I learned things as I got older and stuff like that. And it always appealed to me. And then started like watching movies. But I think the one thing that really sold me uh, was I was like three or four, pretty sure it was like three or four. We were at a Memorial Day parade in uh, Stratford, Connecticut. And I see Marine Corps color guard leading the parade. They're dressed blues. And I asked my dad, I was like, dad, what is that? And he was like, that's something special. He's like, not everybody can be that. And I watched him and I look back at him. He tells me a story and he's just like, I was like, uh, what are they? And he goes, they're Marines. And he said that I watched them till I couldn't see them. And he said, turned around and he said, I'm going to be a Marine. And so from that point on, like I had my grandfather's old K-pop and I wrote USMC on it. And like I had, it's just everything I did. My friends played Army. I played Marine. And, yeah. and that was it. And I was just all in on all things Vietnam. Uh, as a kid, I was like, uh, one of the first books I read was Nam. Uh, and then I found out about Force Recon and I started reading the Force Recon diaries and, um, you just fascinating and just like, Oh, you know, and then again, I'm a product of the eighties, man. I grew up with like, you know, Norris and, and, you know, uh, was it, um, uh, 
Oh man, what was his Vietnam ones? Braddock, back in action or? Yep. Yeah. So that and you know all Stallone and Commando. So it was just like that was it, man. So um, I actually got a phone call from uh, I, I, you never I, I never you know I don't know you never forget your recruiter a staff sergeant Mitch Vuerwet. This guy is, is um, he was aviation. I remember that. So I get a phone call and I'm 16 and he's like, he's like, is Ron Holmes there? And I was like, yeah, it's me. And he's just like, Hey, he's like Bob Schwarm's my neighbor. Uh, he had just enlisted and he's like, um, told me you're interested in becoming a United States Marine. And I was like, I am. And he goes, he's like, well, I'd like to set up time to meet what's good. And I was like, I'm free right now. And he goes, do you know my offices? And I go, yes. And, um, and he's like, all right. And I was like, ah, I'll be there in like 20 minutes. I got on my BMX and psh, hauled ass, psh, got there, um, you know, and then kind of, I don't know, just being a little, me, I'm a little arrogant sometimes. I, I did my little, I bunny hopped up, <laughs> yeah, bunny hopped up the steps and then did like an end around and then get off the bike, leaned it up against the glass and went in. And he was just like, he's like, dude, you're going to have to do that again. But, um, so we sit down we're talking and he's just like, Hey, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, I want to be a Marine. And he's just like, all right, we're here. And he's sitting me down on the couch and putting out the chips. Did you get the tags? The little oh, yeah. plastic tags? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, I remember he's just laying them all out. Like, what's most important to you? And I'm just looking at him. And I was like, I was like, I don't care about any of this. I was like, I just want to be a Marine. And, and he goes, well, you got to pick it because it helps me pick your job. And I was like, I said, I want, I want camouflage. I want an M16. I want to live in the woods. I want to travel the world. And I want to learn how to kill people. And he was like, all right. So we start filling out all the paperwork. And I'm like, uh, 16. And he goes, ah. Oh. So he put his pen down. And, I, and he goes, ah. Oh. I'm like, what? And he's like, you have to be 17, graduated high school, and have your parents' consent. And I was just like, all right. I'm going to quit school. I'm going to get a GED. And I'm just going to go. And, and he's like, no. He goes, we're allowed one GED, um, you know, a quarter. And basically it was the back then, and this is 80, uh, that was like 87 at the time. But he's just like, I, I remember him telling me, he's like, it has to be extenuating circumstances. Like you dropped out of school to get, a, uh, to, to get your GED so you could work because, you know, one of your family members was dead and the other one is like dying, you know, and you're providing for the family. So that's the only exception. And I'm like, damn. And I was like, well, I thought I could finish boot camp. Or I, I thought I could finish high school in boot camp. And he starts cracking up. And he's like, dude, you're like 20 years too late. They ain't done that in years. And I was just like, so I was like, so wait a minute. I was like, so you mean I got to finish high school? And he goes, yeah. And I was like, you know, I think I was like, fuck. And he's like, what? Right. I was like, I thought I was leaving tomorrow. <laughs> and he was just like. Like, dude, like, I, I'm, I've been all in. I was just like, that's all, that's all I wanted. So he's, it, was, it was funny and everything like that. So then the cool thing is, is I, like, was going to all the pool lee functions and mm -hmm. all that. And then um, my parents, they did sign, and they were all about it. They, but they made me – they wanted me to wait until the middle of my senior year just to make sure I didn't have a change of heart and everything like that. And, like, dude, I knew – you know, everything about the Marine Corps before I signed, you know, and then right. I signed on delayed enlistment um, and waited. Let's see. I enlisted in February uh, 89. I didn't go to boot camp until November 89. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, so I did all pulley functions and it was just fun. And I actually, they, I actually kind of got to the point. I'm like, all right, this is actually really boring but I got to do it. Um, and then I was like working for the recruiter. I got people to join, um, you know, and like you got benefits on that stuff and all, yeah. all that good shit. But um, no, nah, man, it was, it, uh, it was fun. Um, I signed delayed enlistments. Um, yeah. And then that was just like my focus. And then I got a phone call. Oh yeah. That's the other thing. I went in open contract. Did you and, really? 
Yeah, and I wanted guaranteed info. Real, real, real quick, real quick, uh, people that out there listening don't know what open contract is. It means you're going to serve at the pleasure of the Marine Corps. <laughs> you are literally going in without a designated job. So you wanted to go guaranteed uh, 0311, which is infantry, but it didn't happen or there was not enough slots or what? So what he said was, and th this is this is that like, little snake charmer that the recruiter, the recruiters will do. So he's like, you got good scores. He goes, but I don't want to send you guaranteed infantry. He's like, you're going to come back. You're going to hate me. You're going to be pissed. Trust me. He goes, I'm going to put you in what's called open contract. And I'm like, Oh, what's that? He goes, you could become a grunt. You could become a sniper. He's like, you could become a, a gunner on a tank. You could become a recomer. He like listed all the good things that I could you be. Could also become a, a cook. <laughs> so, yeah. So he's like, you could be, you know, but he left out being a cook and a mechanic and like, uh, you know, just all the things that I was not interested in. You no, know, there's nothing wrong with cooks no. and mechanics, but I wasn't joining the Marine Corps to, to learn how to make an omelet. I was I, I was joining Marine Corps just to like basically fuck shit up, get some sh work some shit out. Yeah, so I'm like, really? Whoa, you're doing me a favor. This is so awesome. And as I got smarter down the road and I learned things, like, well, he had there was there was no available O three eleven uh, quotas at the time, but he had an op he had like X amount of open contract slots he sure. had to fill. So I got that. And then when I got in the fleet and I'm just like, and then, you know, you know, like the sea stories, the chirping in, in like MCT. Oh, and yeah. when I went to MCT, uh, Marine combat training, yep. it's right after boot camp. It was 28 days um, back when I went, but we were the, we were the third MCT class. Interesting. Cause my recruiter, was an LAV uh, guy, and uh, when I got my scores in, ironically, I was told that I could have any job in the Marine Corps except a mechanic. I think the only questions I missed were mechanical questions. I didn't know. I still to this day don't know how to put yeah. shit through. I'm not good. But he was talking about he was light armored reconnaissance, and he was kind of telling me stories He's like, dude, you want to go in – um, if you can get into Intel or something like this, you know, it's, it's a pretty cool gig and all that. And that's where I went in was, was Intel. It, it's, it's really weird how, um, depending on who you ask, the recruiters were either great or people fucking hate them <laughs> to this yeah. day. People will just say, you know, as I told my, the last episode that we had, we had a recruiter on and yeah, yeah. the problem with that is. The first thing that goes wrong in your career, the first thing they're going to do is my fucking recruiter lied to me you know, or whatever. So anyway, so you go in open contract and, and all of that. It works out, obviously. So how did you get to from open contract to an 0321 down the road? So I, um, we're in MCT and I remember them saying, I think it was like just over the midway point and the living conditions during this time were horrible. We were in, we were in, um, uh, hardback, like GP tents and, mm -hmm. um, yeah, old school. And then, um, like there was, there was porta johns, there was no showers. Uh, like it was crazy. It was February in North Carolina. So it rained every single day. Um, it was, it, and it was a great experience, but we got to shoot like all the, the crew serves, everything. Um, but midway through, they came out with the infantry list. They're like, this is the grunt list. Because back then, you used to have to go to MCT before you went to SOI. <clears throat> oh, when, then, I, when I got it, you went to MCT or SOI. It was yeah. at that point, yeah. And they realized like that was a lot of wasted movement in time. Mm -hmm. If these guys, you already knew that they were going to be infantry. Um, so the infantry list came out, and I wasn't on it. And I'm freaking out. And I'm like, fuck. I'm going to be a cook. Ah, oh, this is not what I want to do. And then they're like, um, and then they, they went down these, uh, you know, and they break it in to sections of the alphabet because the Marine Corps is not creative on that. Um, but it was, um, uh, I got assigned, uh, they're like 2531, field radio operator. And I'm like, oh, what's that? And they're like, grunt with a radio and i'm like i'll take it <laughs> i'm in yep i'm in yeah so from there went to uh went to mct i mean went to uh the stumps to um 
field radar operators course. I think I was there three months. That was interesting. Um, it was fun. It was cool. And then we get our orders. And I remember, I remember our staff sergeant, um, Staff Sergeant Armstrong. And this guy was an old school. He was an old recon comm guy and had this like just this crazy accent it was about a week after we graduated uh or before we graduated they we got our orders and he named out like these names he goes you guys are going you camp pendleton you guys are staying here you guys are camp missouri and, they, and then he didn't call us and he goes these cats here these cats are the lucky ones because we had one in hawaii me and my boy he's like these cats are going to okinawa and uh and we're like we're Okinawa, Japan, and, he, and we're like, we got Marines there, like, sweet. That we were pumped. So I, was too. Yeah. I actually chose. I, when when I got to school, I could choose duty stations, and and um, I sit there and say, if I'm a if I'm a civilian, I'm never going to go to go to Japan. I might as well go over there and have them pay me. So I went over there and had an absolute blessing. You and I actually hung out a lot of the same places, Manhattan and New York, New York, and yeah. Apple House and all of that. But I love this day is one of my favorite places in the world. Uh, but I went there with the mentality of I was only there actually in island for probably half the time because we were gone. Yeah. But I was there. I mean, we went snorkeling, we went scuba diving, hung out. I mean, we made every second count in Okinawa. I love Okinawa. So, anyways, met my wife there, obviously. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a different Marine Corps over there. I just, I, it is. I, I just think it's great. So, I went, uh, yeah. So, my first duty station's there. I, I deploy. Um, August, I think I'm in the Marine Corps, like nine, 10 months, August 2nd, 1990. It's my birthday. I put on Lance Corporal and George Bush, uh, declares war on Saddam Hussein. And it's also a boss's night. So boss's night in Okinawa was a big thing. So I got promoted on boss's night on my birthday. Oh, how'd that go for you? I, I was like, I was, I had the, I remember having the company first sergeant pouring a pitcher of beer down my throat while dudes were just like thumping me like in the arm smashing yeah, yeah. yeah. i'm surprised yeah. you remember any of that <laughs> oh my gosh dude it was it was different though it was fun so then oh yeah go to, uh, i go to korea mm -hmm. we go to korea for um uh camp stanley it was the army camp over there. i don't even know if it's still there but it they had the only um stinger missile like video game so it was a half dome like auditorium and you got to sit up there with a whole stinger missile because I, I was with lab battalion stinger missile battalion and you got to um, yeah like like that yeah you got to track on the aircraft and shoot the aircraft and stuff like that and then um it was combined and then me and everybody in, in my platoon we got called back a week and a half early and packed up and we were on a ship heading to the gulf war um, so my first tour, my first, uh, um, time in Okinawa, I was actually only on Okinawa two months. Yeah. I think I was there like on Island for five months, something like that. Yeah. I, I, I was there. I was there for like that month, went right to Korea, came mm -hmm. home and then came back and had like 37 days and I rotated to Lejeune. Um, yeah. so that's why when I got stationed back there in 90. Five. I was there ninety five to almost ninety nine. Um, I was on Hanson then. I was just. I was so happy because I got to Good like. Nice. I got to take Taco in rice. Taco rice, baby. <laughs> we got to, dude. We. I told you. We made my. Like, we've made that here, and my son loves it. He's like, Dad, my make wife it taco once rice. a month. You know? My wife makes it once a month. Mm -hmm. And we, we have friends over and people are like, oh, you got it. it's 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 taco rice. It's not hard, but people just don't get it. It's amazing. Yep. It is amazing. Yeah. So, like, when I got to Hanson, I got there in in uh, November, early November '94, and um, I get there, check in, and said, uh, "We're leaving in January. You're behind. I'm a PFC, 19 year old PFC. They were leaving in January. You got to catch up." So I spent. I mean, you know how it is when you're behind. You you never really do catch up in a workup, you know. So I just worked my ass off trying. First of all, trying to learn everything because basically when you get out of school, take all that shit, throw it away because you're going to learn how were they do. At least we were. And so I was trying to learn everything, plus trying to prove myself, you know, to to everyone that was there. It was really weird. So we were there, went over uh, to Africa for a little while, came back for a little bit, went over to Korea, came back, went over to 
um, Mount Fuji, Camp Fuji over mainland Japan. And then we're, I was back probably in May, late May, middle of late May. And um, then at that point, I stayed in Okinawa um, the rest of the time. And so I left back in, in November. So I love, like I said, I, I love Okinawa. I still to this day do. Um, we try to go back every you know four, five or six years, uh, see her family and all that. But it's, it's just a beautiful place. It really is. You know, uh, one of the things that <clears throat> got me being a boot, and there's a lot of, lot of dudes who were pissed, who were communicators, who were like, I'm senior to him. We were the first class in comm school to have been taught the DCT. Oh, yeah. So the DCT, I think it's there for digital control terminal or digital compute, something like that. And it was this whole like words from analog to digital. That was the transition, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. It was this big digital like display, very, very basic touch screen. That yeah. was iffy, and then you hook it, and then you could already have you already had your um, preloaded formats in there. You know your nine line, your med back, your casvac, all that stuff. You just would have to fill it out, and then it got to the point where it's like sometimes it's just like you know what, this is easier. Hey, check it out. But but because I knew that, and that was the new technology, that and the Patriot missile, everything, and we were with the lab battery. We were attached to a Hawk missile battery. Oh, nice. And hawks don't exist anymore. Um, so all these things. So everybody was on the same page with that. So that's what got me into the platoon that was um, deploying. So I'm, I'm, I have to be forever grateful to the DCT. Um, you know, and, and I just, I would never, it's just like the whistles on ship. I will never forget when the alarm goes off because I used to have to sleep with it next to my head. And it's just like, dee -dee -dee, dee -dee. it's just this most annoying. Model. But um, yeah, so that's what got me to deploy was that one piece, learning that piece of gear, being in the right place at the right time. <laughs> for, for me, it was, I was low man in the totem pole. I was the 19 year old PFC and they basically said, you're going over here with a 31st Mew and you're heading out. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, like, you're low man, you get to go. I was like, well, you know, once again, I went over there saying, hey, I want to enjoy my experience. I want to do anything and every, I, I went with the mentality, I want to do everything that I can. And so I, I went in, you know, heads in, balls in, I was like, let's do this then and all that. So yeah, it was great. So yeah. everyone has that, wants to know about Marine Corps boot camp and all that. And everyone seemingly has that, oh shit moment. Like it's reality, this is happening and I can't leave. Did you have one of those moments? <clears throat> I think, it was uh, the one day where it really all came together was the gas chamber. <laughs> um, after the gas chamber, it was just like, I was just like, uh, uh, it was most horrible I've ever felt in my life. And we get cleaned up and everything like that. And then it was also the very first time we had, because it was the start of, um, what was it called back then? Uh, BT. Italian training, infantry, BIT, I can't remember. Uh, well, when you, talk, when, when you went into the field for the two weeks? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't, so remember, what it's called. I don't remember what it's called, but it, that it, sucked. Yeah, it started with the gas mask. It started with, yeah. it was a 26, you know, it was a McCrest hump out. Um, set up bivouac, mm -hmm. go over, go to the gas chamber, and then get cleaned up after the gas chamber and then have our first MRE. Yep. And my first MRE was the five fingers of death. Oh. The, freaking, the Frank, the Frank birders. And it was just like, I remember like taking a bite and I'm just like, I'm supposed to eat this raw. Like that was the first time I, I like, I think I actually complained and I was just like, what the <laughs> fuck? Like <laughs> it's just in my mind now, I'm starting to think like, this is all I'm going to eat. Like are right. these things now fast forward when I was in the Gulf War, it the people don't even understand deployments up until two if until nine eleven happened deployments for the Marine Corps were were very Spartan to to put it politely. That's, um, a, that's a good way of putting it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we would get T rats. So for those of you who don't know what a T-Rat is, a T-Rat is an MRE just on a much larger scale that uses an oven or some, some open flame. Device. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, we lived on those for um, eight months, seven months, yeah. seven months till they got the chow hall. They're not terrible. I mean, it's not a sit down meal, but they're you. I don't, I don't know. They're not terrible, or you just got used to them. I don't know, but they're not. They weren't terrible. There was some. Yeah, it was all right. And every now and then, every now and then, you got the the warm breakfast. That was the powdered eggs, but the warm breakfast every now and then was like the greatest thing ever. Look back and say, I, I was looking forward to the rubber bacon and the powdered eggs. Yes, I was, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Murray's is where, where I learned to use hot sauce. Um, yeah, but I, I was really weird. I would put peanut butter and hot sauce on everything and just eat it that way. So my favorite, and we were, we'll get into the, the, the pit, the rapid fire questions later on, but, you know, my – my favorite MRE was the beef stew, but I would take the crackers, put it in the open pouch. I would take the peanut butter and squeeze it into the beef stew, stir it all up. And it's yeah. gross, it's gross, but it was good, dude. It was good. really good. It was so good. <laughs> dude, when we were uh, in Somalia, we were working with the Norwegians, and theirs were like these little, they were like old school sea rats, like metal yeah. cans, and they all came with like a little eight-ounce can of wine. Seriously? Yeah. Yeah. All oh, their sea rats. And they're, dude, their sea rats, there was like caviar. Caviar, wine, crackers. Like, it was crazy. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. When you think of boot camp, it kind of embodies what your experience at boot camp was? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I remember um, go and receiving, sitting and receiving, and it was just like, it is funny. I actually had a tattoo. I had my first tattoo. I got Mighty Mouse tattooed on my arm. And um, uh, we're in receiving. And uh, God, I don't even know how I remember this dude's name. Drill, drill instructor, Staff Sergeant Resto. Um, just typical, as I know now, typical jarhead, skips leg day, nothing but curls and shrugs. <laughs> That's and, the way it goes, though. Yeah. And um, uh, was... We're sitting there, you know, we're doing the health, the health and comfort. You're in your draws and everything like that. And he looks at, looks at my tattoo and he's like, he's like, is that Mighty Mouse? And I go, yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 yes whatever the fuck is supposed to say. Right. And, uh, and he's like, how much you pay for that? And I'm like, 150, sir. He goes, $150. And I was like, yeah. He goes, for $150. He goes, I have fucked two bitches and get three tattoos. <laughs> it's like, dude, and the whole squad bay erupted. Right. And, um, <laughs> oh yeah dude yeah so i'm like i'm like all right so was this and then realizing then we get handed off to our actual platoon and they gave us the, the first thing you get is that class on how to make the rack and i'm making my rack and i'm on the bottom bunk and i turn and as i turn to move my elbow hit the the, the heavy um Stasson hernandez hit <sighs> his his um belt and knocked the belt off and the belt went off, and dude, and he was just like, his hands went on a smoke, and he was like, <gasps> and he reached down and picked it up. And he's like, he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, I, and he goes, I, <laughs> I had PCs on, right? I had the glasses, and he goes like this. Like, Buddy Holly glasses? Private, dude, he's jamming his finger into my glasses, right? I, private, I, private, and I'm just like, J -j 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 -j. and then he disappeared, and I'm like, that was absolutely horrible, and I don't even know what what I, what happened, and but that was like, ah, and then you just learn, then you just learn the game. <laughs> I, I, I've never been a religious person, but I became very religious during boot camp because you got an hour every <laughs> Sunday in the chapel, you know, and I was like, oh, hell yeah, I'm going to church, you know, um, but no, it's it's one of those that uh, and, and you learn over time, um, but we had a guy who was my bunk mate, uh, it's like maybe uh, a week or two is right after we, we, it was about a week after we transitioned from receiving into our actual platoon. Um, and his name was Mitchell, and he was on the top bunk, and I was on the bottom. And I remember um, one morning, Reveille goes off, and we're getting, we're getting up, we're getting everything done, making my rack and all that. And I look up, and Mitchell's still in his fucking in rack. And I'm shaking. I'm doing, come on, get the, you know, we got like a minute left. You've got to get, you know, online and all that. And all of a sudden, time runs out. And I'm thinking, I'm fucked because he's my, he's my bunk mate. Like, whatever happens to him is going to happen to me. I'm screwed at this point, you know? 
And so our hard hat comes on, uh, Sav, uh, Sergeant Habiger, we call him hard balls, but uh, Habiger comes over and he's like, Mitchell, time to get up, Mitchell. And I'm sitting there just fucking, oh, this is going to suck for me, you know? And all, you all of a sudden you hear. You association because you share bunks. I share bunks, and it is my responsibility to get his ass out of bed. Well, I'm trying to get my own ass out of bed at four o'clock in the morning, you know? And all of a sudden, you hear this Mitchell, time to get up. And all of a sudden, the squad base is quiet, and you hear, Okie doke, Sarge, just give me a minute. And we're just like, oh dear God. He grabbed him. His feet never came down off the gr- onto the ground. He grabbed him up against the wall and he turns around he goes everybody fall out and so we're hauling ass out of the squad bay at giving formation going to chow that morning we come back and his shit is gone like no like he didn't exist ever and we're just like oh snap i think they killed him you know so the, the rumor was is that havoker killed mitchell for the longest time and we're and like all the was needed because the, the yeah, actual going on, everybody's like, I am not going to be Mitchell. <laughs> yeah, and, and, I, and I think they do that. I think they make an example out of one person right away to get everybody in the mentality of you're here and you ain't going anywhere. Um, so, yeah, boot camp. I enjoy boot camp. Uh, the physical side for me was easy. I'm a smart ass. You know that. So my whole mentality was is just keep my mouth shut. Yeah. Don't be a smart ass. Keep my mouth shut. Get through this shit and let's move on. Uh, so you go to MCT and all that. So we talked a little bit about being a uh, field ro- radio operator. Um, so that was your primary MOS was a field radio op. Some people don't realize that that force recon has its own school. It is a volunteer thing, and it's a process, a long process to get that 0321. So can you kind of explain once you did your time as a field at radio how you got involved with force and all of that stuff, because that's probably people don't really know how people get into MARSOC and with force recon. So one of the things I think is interesting now, it didn't exist years ago, is that you can actually enlist in the Marine Corps on an 0321 contract. And yep, really? it's, been that, it's, been, it's been that way for quite a while. Wow. And oh, wow. okay. what you actually get is, is, I mean, I'm sure there's bonuses and stuff like that, but provided you perform and you make it through, you will, you'll essentially be in 0321 post boot camp, and you will uh, spend your entire career in reconnaissance community. So you get the guarantee of the school. Now, whether or not you pass the school is up right. to you, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, you're not guaranteed 0321. You still have so it. If you, if you don't make it through school, you go back to Uncle Sam's misguided children, right? You're just whatever they want the hell you to be? Correct. Correct. Okay. So, um, so back in my day, so I was in Anglico and then gets orders mm-hmm. back to Okinawa and I get assigned to fifth force and then I go to fifth force and I take my in dock and I get put into a platoon and I start, I'm essentially, I'm a rope, uh, even, you know, doesn't matter your rank time and your accomplishments, you, everybody starts the same and then just had a very long uh long 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 intense painful um uh road and okinawa back then so again we're going we're talking 90s uh and money was really not existing in the marine corps so um the command was authorized by the schoolhouses to run their own ojt program so for me, uh, we went through rip every day was rip and everything like that. And then eventually, um, I was given the 0321 MOS as my secondary. Um, I had an opportunity to go 0321 primary. Mm-hmm. Um, but I kind of like with the whole first sergeant to master sergeant, you know, decision, uh, I wanted to. I had a lot of pride that I was a reconnaissance communicator and I wanted to, I wanted to stay that course because even early on and, and it's, it, I think it's like, um, uh, I don't know. It was a, it was a great end to my story uh, or my time in the Marine Corps was one of the things that we had always complained about is that we're doing as a communicator, 
we have to do our job and we have to do your job and we have to do all of them flawlessly. So what I also found in the community was that comm guys, riggers and docs all really had a very, we all were very, very close because we all did two jobs. Um, and not a big deal. It's not that one was harder than the other, this that, and the other, they all supported the other. Uh, but we, what we had wanted all the, the whole time was, um, and our complaint was, we need our own MOS. We need our, if you're, if you have a 0321 secondary, then that should make us, cause then they changed 2531 to like, like 0621, right? So we're like, we wanted 0622 means you're a reconnaissance communicator. And then we are designated there. So the problem was on that is I, as, as a communicator, primary communicator, I am in a volunteer unit. I could unvolunteer out of force and go to another unit anytime, anytime you want, essentially, right? People would call you shit bag or whatever, but that, that's your choice, but it won't, it, it can't affect you negatively. Right. Um, but in a volunteer unit, in a volunteer organization already, I'm competing against people who aren't doing what I'm doing, don't have the deployments that I do, but have gone, had time to go to all their careers and stuff like that. So their paper looks better, you know? And it's just like, that was our thing. It's like, I was like, there's nothing that says that they're not good at their job, but we should not be competing against them for the, for the same promotion. So when, um, uh, when I'm at Marsoc and we got our new G6 in Colonel Doug Caliano, dude's awesome. <laughs> Me and him sit down for our one-on-one. -on -one. He's like, top, what's, what's the biggest, your biggest concern? And I was like, we need our own special operations communications MOS system, completely separate from the Marine Corps, from, from the regular CNE stuff. They have to have their own system. These guys are, these guys, if any of them leave here and go back to the fleet, they're not going to know what they're using because no, none of the equipment is the same as ours. Right. And I was like, it is, they're on a higher plane and they should not be competing for the same promotions as everybody else. Um, so it, it's, um, it was one of the things that got pushed through and everything like that. And there's the SMEs and, and the designators and stuff like that. So um, <clears throat> I'm not exactly where sure it is now, but that was one of the things that we always wanted. So going back to uh, having two MOSs, and I've ended up with, I've, like you probably, I've had like a, I've got like a dozen MOSs, but I wanted to keep, I wanted to keep to the roots. I, I took pride in being, being really good at HF communications and creating antennas and being able to do a comm shot around the world. You know, and I wanted to be able to continue to do that in the, in that community. And that was always a fight to stay in the community because my primary wasn't 0321. And when it wasn't until I was like, one of the things that really helped me is when I became a jump master. Because jump master is a critical, um, a critical skill, and uh, so that was one of the things that weighed heavily on keeping me in the, part of me in the community. So yeah, that's awesome. Um, so we know that you spent some time over in Desert Storm. You spent some time over in Okinawa. You spent some time in Somalia. We shared some dirt there. I think. I think we actually we replaced you guys a little bit after uh, you guys left. Um, is there any place that, like, you wanted to go that you never got a chance to? Uh, I looked at, you know, it's funny, is it's like I, I had interest in going to HMX1 to be a communicator at HMX1. But it was also the same time I had became, I had become a recon marine. Um, and it was just, I was just exploring it, looking at options. And I remember doing a phone interview with them from Okinawa. <clears throat> And I was looking at it because I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to get orders when I leave Okinawa mm -hmm. to back to a, a, a recon unit. So I was just going to stay in Okinawa until I couldn't. Um, but uh, I called and I had a phone interview at HMX1. And <clears throat> the guy's doing his whole thing. It is Gunny. And he's just like, have you ever had a speeding ticket? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, how many? And I'm like, like my whole life and he goes yeah and i was like i don't know at least 20 and he's just like yeah that disqualifies you i'm like what he goes yeah you have a you have a um psychological imbalance for posted authority and i was like all right well gunny thanks for your time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I hung up. 
I was like, that was that. And I, I, um, I went to Yemen. I, I spent a very long time in Yemen in um, 03, 04. And um, long hair, you know, beard on a different type mm-hmm. of mission. And we were working out of the embassy. And I got to work with the, with the embassy Marines. And I was like, man, I wish I would have done that early on. Something that I always well, I thought was really unique. Um, just talking to guys who 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 been on the program and uh, a lot of cool opportunities, a different a different side of things, um, you know. But as as we you know from the time I went into even up to now, but like, embassies be, have become a target. So these guys like they've had to develop some pretty good skills and stuff like that. So I always thought that was something I'd like to do because I really wanted to get some embassy duty in, you know, Sweden or Norway, someplace where I could like, I would snowboard all the time. Um, so my best friend got MSG and he got Ethiopia. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it could be a lot more. The good. The coffee's good. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, it turned into a nice thing for him later down in life. He went to Blackwater before Blackwater was <laughs> all that. But yeah, but yeah he, he got he found out and he, I, got, I got Ethiopia. I'm like, <laughs> just he was laughing. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, man. So. Yeah. 20 years, you reach the, the rank of Master Sergeant, which uh, most people don't realize it, it's, it's a, that's a big, big deal. Um, of all the ranks that you had, though, what is the one rank that you were most proud of earning? I think the one I'm most shocked was putting on Master Sergeant. Uh, okay. I, did get, uh, I got arrested on Elmendorf Air Force Base as a gunny and got a derogatory page 11 for having a loaded pistol in my, in my truck. Wow. Um, and I was just like, I remember that my counseling, the major, she was just like, this is the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And I was like, what? She goes, this is going to ruin your career. And I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, you're, you're not going to be able to get promoted. I'm like, oh, wait. So I get to stay a gunny, stay an operator and do let's see, deal. Yeah. I did 22 years as a gunny, get a combat extension up to 24 years and stay operating my whole time. If I knew that this is what it was going to take, I would have done this years ago. And, and I looked at her, and she was just looking at me. I was like, I didn't join the Marine Corps to get promoted. I came in to, like, I look at her. I came in to fuck shit up. You want to be a fucking door kicker, man. That's it. You know, and then um, uh, I told her, I was like, look, I didn't even want to be a gunny. I was like, yeah. I, I was cool being a staff sergeant because you can retire. You can tenure 20 years as a staff sergeant. I was cool with that. And I was like... And I was like, I've kind of learned that mentality from the Brits. They have four ranks, you know, and they yeah, promote yeah. and they want to. You know, yeah. you meet a dude with like 20 years and he's a Lance Corporal. Now he's getting paid. He's getting paid. On, on, he's getting paid to scale what his, his peers are, but he has right. Lance Corporal responsibilities. And I'm like, brilliant. But I, I, I made the best of it. I liked it. So, I mean, I love being a gunny. Um, I, all, all of them were like, came at different times in leadership. Um, I re-enlisted, I put corporal on, and this is going to blow youngsters' minds away, but I re-enlisted after four years as a corporal and didn't put sergeant on for almost another, a full year after. Oh, yeah. That it, that, that, that happened with us. We, we had guys that were six-year corporals. Yeah, finally in sergeant, you know, you're like, what the hell? Well, and and at the time when I was in, I'm sure what year, there's only so many that you they have, especially in your unit and all of that, to where it, it's a kid's competitive as hell. So there were people when I was in that were getting out in the four years as a Lance Corporal, they never even pinned on Corporal before. Yeah, so it was very, very crazy back in those days. Yeah, so we, I remember when I came up to re enlist my first time, um, it. There was seven boat spaces for 25, 30 okay. months. And there was a hundred and Marine Corps wide. Marine Corps wide. And there was like 111 dudes fighting for them. And I got I got number two. Nice. And I was like, so obviously I stayed in. Um, but it's like uh, you know, you look back now and it's like there's dudes that are re enlisting at like four years and their staffs aren't select. And, you know, in certain jobs and I'm just like, man, but, you know, so I, that, I put on sergeant and then I went to, um, I went to sergeant boot camp, what I like to call it. And so I, I went to that. That was honestly my least, like my, my least favorite thing I did. I just didn't enjoy that school. Um, 
I also, and the reason is not going to be why you think, but the reason I didn't enjoy it is um, I am dyslexic and I had a, have a learning disability that I've had to work through. The Marine Corps doesn't, um, doesn't provide, doesn't give a shit. They don't give that. a shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, they're sitting there and I was, I had a couple tests that I had failed and they go in and the guys like, Hey, what are you doing? Are you like, screwing around every you know blah 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 and i'm like no i was just like i i study and i don't know and and, and uh and he's like can you do it like, verbally you know he, i'll ask it ask me the questions he starts asking me questions and i'm getting them right he goes yeah. those are all those are the questions you got wrong he goes you just got them all right and i was like yeah i was like hey gunny i was like when i was in elementary school i used to take all my exams would be verbal because i can't i just can't see it and he was just looked at me. He's like, he's, he just basically was like, you fucking with me? <laughs> I'm like, no. So it took it. I think at that point I had to learn a lot about myself and how to over, like, I didn't learn how to study. I didn't know how to study correctly. I didn't know how to study for me. And I think it was, let's see, to, 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 it was probably when I got, when I, Got, got it uh, to Fifth Force Recon, uh, Fifth Force Reconnaissance Company is when I started seeing the value of actually having to master your craft and put in that extra work, um, you know, and sit there. And then it became bragging rights and everything from everything from not tying to swimming to setting up your gear to being better and thinking and understanding frequency ranges and having antennas pre cut and doing it, but then doing everything blindfolded at night, you know. Um, so it wasn't, I don't think until then, so I actually started to develop good study habits, um, on that. Um, but yeah. That's awesome. Is there a story throughout your career? 20 years, there's a ton of stories and I know this, you can't talk about a lot of stuff and that's cool, but is there a story that you can talk about that, um, basically sums up and says this is something that could only happen in the military civilians will never get this they'll never experience this they'll never understand it's only people that have that have been in the suck um would understand this story um well in the gulf war uh when you it, with the hawk missile batteries when they would change over shift they would do arm up arm down just mm -hmm the equipment right test the, the the launch pad off and dude wasn't paying attention and shot a rocket that was pretty interesting um let me see did how'd that go did, for him yeah it didn't go very well um, yeah, so. we, well we thought we were being attacked everybody just like psh, went full mop gear in there right. fight holes sitting there and the radios are blown up um yemen was a good one we're driving we're in thin skin because everything we did, we weren't really there. And uh, we're driving in our Land Cruisers um, up on one you of the Land Cruisers? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My, dude, right hand that's drive. What we use. That's right what we drive. use over there. We, we got the worst. When, we, when I was over in Africa, we wore civilian clothes and we had Land Cruisers. So I guess that's a, that's, that must be a thing. Uh, I don't know. Land Land Cruisers. Cruisers. Um, yeah, uh, man. They're, 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 they're different they're than the ones here. They're different. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I, side note, I think Toyota, I think uh, like all the big car manufacturers have like pay Toyota a lot of money not to release the high lux four cylinder diesel in the States because they know it will destroy the American truck market. Mm -hmm. Like that, that high mm, lux. Absolute beast. That, that Toyota diesel is insane. But yeah. um, we're driving, you know, we, we had our three vehicles and just constantly, you know, just blending in and everything like that. And then all of a sudden, dude, this uh, limo is coming up behind us, like high rate of speed. And we're just like, all right, you know, what's going on? And then this dude, like no shit, like something from like an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, pops out of the sunroof with a freaking RPG in a limo. Like in snapped it on you guys? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we're like, we're like, we're looking around and we were, uh, we were in the front. It was, it was vehicle here. He gets over and all, all of us had like, you know, there was two or three people in it turned around. AKs are out the window and then they drove by 
Guy came back in with RPG and stands out and waves and then took off. Just wanted us to get out of the way. He doesn't know how close he was, does he? <laughs> he doesn't know how close he was. He lit it up. It was just like, <laughs> what is going on? What is going on? Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. that was That's a pretty good one, man. Yemen was... Yemen's a, it was a really interesting place, but um, yeah, that one's pretty funny. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. So we're going to transition a little bit now, and you know, life post Marine Corps, and obviously you've been very successful, and and, and obviously you you stayed very very busy starting up a company with Riker USA, and you, and you're doing the firearms instruction and all of that. Um, I want you to talk a little bit about Riker USA and all that. And we've got your sling right here. We got your grip right there and our battle rifle. Love this products, guys. RikerUSA.com. Go check out the sling and the uh the grip. It's awesome. But what I really want to talk about is maybe what you learned from the Marine Corps and, and what part of the Marine Corps helped you transition to being a successful entrepreneur and all of that post Marine Corps life. At the end, I got scared to retire uh, when I already had a retirement date and because you don't really understand value, your self-worth. And some things you got to – you have to take yourself back to the day that you stood and you raised your right hand and you made a, 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 a contract with the country um, basically to donate your life for our way of life. And um, – you have to go back to that moment, I think. And remember that no one made you do that. And for whatever reason, good, bad, or indifferent, why you did it, you did it. And you have to own your shit. Like, you just have to, like, realize it. You know, yeah, you can have your highs and lows and good days and bad days, right? But you can't sit there and feel, and feel sorry for yourself, right? It's not allowed. You have to be able to be like, ah, oh, I'm better than this. I can do this. I was taught better than this. Um, don't let yourself be a victim. So I think one of the things that helps me, you know, that has helped me is just um, it's foundation, you know, is just like, yeah, I, I want to do things. Like I have a very creative mind and I want to keep moving forward and I want to do, you know, help people and teach and, and I want to take the things that I learned. This is kind of what I've, when I started teaching firearms instruction, you know, it was just basically it was like I started competitive shooting right before I retired because it was fun and it was shooting and I didn't have to make the course of fire and I was being challenged. And then we're having people from the gym who are just like, hey, can you teach me how to do that? And then I'm just like doing it a lot. And I'm like, and I'm using my ammo and I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> there's something there's i'm like losing money when i could be making money here right so and it just kind of led into it and so now i'm my theory now is is where i live in eastern north carolina is if you live in my community and you are going to carry a gun i want to have a hand in that i want to take my 25 years of service to the country and i want to help you be a more confident firearms owner. I want to give my life experience into however much time and however many times people come to train with me. I want that to translate. So that didn't happen right away. I learned that as I've gone along, um, that I want to make a difference in my community. You know, one of the things I tell my son who's four, when I drop him off at school, you know, give him my hug and kiss. And I was like, be a good person and help people. And he goes, yep. And he goes, dad, I got my med pack. I got my med, my med kit in my backpack, right? So, like, that's, that's like, so these things that I've learned, I'm looking at it now as, like, I'm planting seeds. Don't, if my son, does, I don't even, don't care. I just want to be a good person. I don't, don't, right. it doesn't have to join the military. It's not it at all. Um, but I just want him to have a, a, a really good foundation as putting others first. Um, I think when I did this for Tots in Alaska, I just when I got introduced to Rotary's. And one of the things that they say at all rotary meetings is service before itself. And right. that resonated with me in so many levels. So um, the Marine Corps has given me so much. Um, 
And to the point where as my son grows up, he doesn't, he hasn't seen the bad side of it. You know, he hasn't seen like his dad was never gone and deployed and this, that, and the other and, and all that. And um, so I'm very fortunate on that, that it, he's going to grow up with the mystique of it, like being very appealing, kind of like how I grew up with it. And then as he gets older and he, he starts to understand the concept of time and timelines, and he's going to be like, wait a minute, you did that for 20 years before you met my mom? You know, so it's, it's, uh, I look at it like that. So I just look at just like every day is, is a gift. Um, I, sh I, I, uh, you know, like you, I like I have cheated death many, many times should not be here. Um, but I'm here for a reason. So, um, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm fortunate and I'm grateful and I've got an amazing family, uh, you know, from my family I came from, but my wife's family and it's just, um, you know, it's, it's awesome. But the Marine Corps has definitely, um, you know, shaped, shaped many, many things in my life. Um, fitness and discipline and understanding when you know you give your word you 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 show up show up right and and do what you're going to say and then um you know i think one of the things too i've learned is <clears throat> is my definition of loyalty is only shared with <clears throat> my brothers and my definition of loyalty is right wrong and different if you call me at two o'clock in the morning and say i fucked up bring a shovel here's a grid and i'm there Right. We're going to talk about it when I get there. We're going to work it out, but I'm going to be there. That's loyalty. That's loyalty. I have not found that just other than with one person, not military, who is one of my brothers. And it's a hard commitment for a lot of people who haven't been um, in service to the country that don't really understand the commitment of, of I am my brother's keeper. And I think it's sadly, like, if you look at now, one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to help spread the word about with, with some of my Marsoc brothers is the Marsoc three who are being hung out to dry. They are being and, hung out to dry. Yeah, and to be completely acquitted. And it's just, I, and, and again, it's beyond, it's beyond that. It's, it, it, that's wrong, but it's for whatever reason, the culture there is just that we don't, do we really take care of our own? So yeah, I actually read somewhere not too long ago, maybe last week. I, I keep trying to keep up, with it, but they've got video evidence that's going to exonerate them. The whole but thing they refuse. The whole to, thing is on video, but they're still they're still refused, at this court. Refused court. To submit it, their command refused to watch it. Right, and it's like you know, so it's it's going to be interesting to see what happens. And and I love the fact and, and, and the Marsoc three. I uh, just Google Marsoc three guys. It's it's not that hard to find. Google, you, 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 you these. Mean, uh, uniform hmm. Alpha Papa Marsoc three, and thank God um, for I want to say he's a, a retired colonel uh, is the attorney that took this on pro bono and was like I got this. Uh, talk about the brotherhood. He's like, look, I got this, and and, and that's just something that um, I think it's in March or April that they're supposed to have the 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 date. April, but it but, might be pushed again. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Yeah. Yeah, so no, this, this is a terrible thing. A lot of time with with, uh, with one of the guys, and he's been he's actually been one of my assistant instructors, and I've known him. I was a gunny when I met him, and he was a lance corporal. Yeah. So, and he should be a master sergeant right now. How's his mentality right now? Is everything good? Dude, the dude's like so laser laser focused. He's an entrepreneur. He's getting ready to launch a small batch bourbon called Southern Cross. Um, trying to help they also use it as a fundraiser to help them with their legal fees sure. and all that. But he's thinking forward. He's thinking like, I'm going to win. I'm going to beat this and I have to start looking at what's next. So, but yeah, so that's the thing too, is going back to what did the Marine Corps give me? The Marine Corps gave me responsibility. Yeah. Um, I have a responsibility to my community beyond my family, but to my community. But I, I still mentor uh, half a dozen kids who I've met, Locally, I've met, been introduced to, who've reached out to this and the other. Um, I still mentor kids who want to join or who, or who are in, um, and not just in the Marine Corps. And um, I feel that I will paint a picture for them of reality that they won't get from their recruiter. 
Um, I will help them, uh, you know, make decisions and start trying to have the, the, the forward thinking of like, if I do this now, what is the next step? How is this, could this potentially affect me? What's the right thing to do? This is the thought part. This is the critical thinking part of it. So I, 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 t I take that as, as my responsibility. Um, I will talk to anybody. I will help anybody I can that, especially, especially in the state of affairs that our country's in right now, um, any young American or even, even non-citizen, even somebody from another country that wants to come here and serve our country, any, any person right now that wants to raise that right hand and take that oath of enlistment, I, I, I have a duty to help you. Absolutely. I do. I care about the country. I care about the future of our military. I care about about the care and, and the treatment and of them. And if I can help them in any way, be not like get through, but be great. That that's my responsibility. So I don't, I don't know, man. That's like a really like not an easy question to answer. Like what did no, I get? Not, no. for? <laughs> Well, and it's one of those things where everyone gets in a different, and, and I was in much, much more than you were. Um, and, and when I got out of the Marine Corps, I had a very bad taste in my mouth of some stuff that happened in that last six to eight months that I was in, whether it was having to change uh, MOSs and being stuck somewhere that I didn't want to be and, and couldn't go back to where I wanted to be, having an asshole uh, staff NCO that didn't know what was going on with me, but was just thr trying to thrash me and two other of my guys uh, for seemingly no reason. So it, it took, when I got out in 98, it took, it sounds bad. I had a really bad taste in my mouth and it took the towers falling for me to realize that I was proud of what I did and I, and I still love that country. So my, my love for the Marine Corps came back after 9-11, but I went a couple of years of just really having a really bad taste. And looking back on that time now, I was just selfish. It's really what it was. I was just selfish. And, and that really upsets me to look at my life and said, I really put myself in a position of having disdain towards an uh, organization that I love today and my brothers and all of that. And we still talk. A lot of us do talk. But, you know, it was just one of those things where it was just really, really bad there for a little while. Hey, man, it's it's like people always ask me, like, Ron, when, when's it time? How do you know when it's time to go? And I'm like, when it's not fun. Like, not every day is fun. Not every day is the lottery. Mm -hmm. There, there's there's days you're going to have bad days but when it becomes the burden when it becomes like i can't pick my head up i can't stand up straight i can't i can't shake this thing that's on my back that's when you know it's time to go um so what we're going to do now is we're going to have some fun um we all remember the pit and boot camp so what we're called the pit here is a rapid fire word association this is when you think of something what's the first thing that comes to your uh your head you ready to go all right all right first question best and worst mre dehydrated pork patty which doesn't even exist anymore wow okay Dehydrated pork patty. That doesn't sound very good <laughs> in any way. What was the best MRA you ever had? Spaghetti. Okay. Oh, nice. Um, the best place you ever went? Alaska. Alaska. The worst place you ever were? Flat bottom ship. Thank you. All right. Your favorite weapon system to shoot? Man, like, uh, probably I would say the 416. Okay. The HK? HK. I, yeah, just, good, good. I, I love that gun. And yeah. it, it's a toss up between HK and the Emperor, the MP5. Yep. Uh, uh, for me, it was the MP5 and uh, the real MP5, not what they've got out here, but yeah. the real MP5 and a Mark 19, just because the Mark 19 is just badass. It really was. It was just badass. Uh, but yeah, MP5 is great. The, the, I never got to shoot the 416. Um, um, I carried one. We are still uh, using the Colts, man. You know? I carried one for quite a few years, and I just, guys would complain like it's heavy, and I'm like, um, it's perfect. It's just like, yeah. it, it's amazing. But anything H and K does is perfect. Pretty damn good, absolutely. Uh, what was your uh, first car? Nineteen seventy nine Chevy Suburban. 
Oh, shit with the brown. beast, man. Hell yeah. Shit brown with a tan highlighted center stripe with chrome trim, right? Yes. Vinyl bench seats with a herringbone pattern, which was brown and beige, but over, you know, the sun had faded over the 10 years and it was brown and yellow, right? <laughs> this is the best part, dude. The best part is the back, when you put down the third row, it was all padded AstroTurf. Nice. <laughs> what? Why no, not? No, 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 here's why. My dad bought it from Vegas Funeral Parlor in, in Middletown, Connecticut. And they used to use it to transport the dead bodies to the moor or to the, to the funeral parlor to get them ready to bury. So uh, where I'm from, we had like rural, rural areas. So they had the, the yellow Suburbans. Uh, yep. For the kids that lived out in the rural areas, and they were called carry alls. So we just called my truck the carry all. I would have called the Undertaker. <laughs> well, dude, and everybody was just like, "Yo, I heard you. Yo, there was like, yo, yo, there was dead bodies in this." And I'm like, "Yeah, and they're like, yo, that's dope, bro. That's sick." Like, so yeah, that was, that was my first truck, dude. Big old three fifty, big old V eight. You know, we do we put we would drive around in that thing and put so much stuff. Uh, so many people in it, and just have it a blast. Do you kind of wish you still had that thing just for the hell of it? Uh, yeah, so it's funny is my, my wife's actually standing right here. Um, I'm like looking for I, I found in 1982 fully restored lifted green forest green suburban. Uh, yeah, in Colorado it. for like 18 grand. And I'm just like, uh, oh, like I want to get rid of my F-150. And yes, so yes, do I admit I want, that's my dream truck. Like I want that truck. It's it's uh, like no electronics in it, right? Yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. have, I'll put it, I'll get an iPad with the Wi-Fi so I have my maps, but nothing is just, it's just awesome. Solid, it's steel. Really? That's what my dad got it for me. He's like, basically yeah. he's like, look, you're kind it's of an idiot. Bro. Um, and I don't, you know, he goes, if you're going to be driving, he just want you to be in something that's be very hard to take off the road. So that was my first vehicle, favorite vehicle. But who's your favorite superhero? I don't I, like when I was a kid, it was like Superman yeah. and it was, yeah. you know, Luke Skywalker and Han Solo. Um, yeah. but as I've gotten older and I look for depth. I look for like other things like I really relate to dead Deadpool, but I think mm -hmm. my ultimate favorite is if I had to pick, I do love Din Djarin, Mandalorian, even mm -hmm. though the guy who plays him is um, not very pro American, but um, uh, Spawn. I'm going to have to go with Spawn. Oh, yeah. Nice. I actually have a tattooed on my arm. Um, Al Simmons was, a, was a recon Marine in, in, you know, in the, in the Spawn story. And the thing I really like about Spawn is that Spawn was was Earth's greatest warrior, and he was lied to, manipulated to get back to to his family by the devil, and given all these powers to go and do the devil's bidding, and then starts getting hip to the plan that um, he's just been bamboozled, right. and he turns around and he starts doing good with the powers that he was given from from evil. And he's he remains in the shadows, and he and he operates in the dark, and he finds sanctuary and refuge in abandoned churches, and um, you know it's just I just found that to be very like that duality. Like if you look at our life in the in the Marine Corps, and like what, what like uh, Mark Luttrell said it. He goes he goes the Marines are good at killing people. Mm -hmm. He goes they're the best at it. You just let them go, and they'll get it done, right? That's right. So I like Spawn. I would have to say it's Spawn. Uh, I do have a tattoo tomorrow. And cool thing is, is my dog was in a movie a few years ago here in Wilmington, and um, oh. he, and the, and the key act, the lead actor was Michael Jai White, who no played kidding. Spawn. And I took him. I took him and uh, and his boy. I took them shooting a few times. Spent some time with them and everything like that. But when I first met him, he wanted to meet the dog and everything like this. And I showed him my Spawn tattoo. And he was like, whoa, shit. And it turns out he and I are like, we're from, we grew up like an hour apart. Oh, wow. um, yeah, so, but it was really cool getting to meet him and then tell him like, uh, and I was just like, I got to express to him why I like Spawn and the importance of it. And, and just, and I thanked him for bringing the character to life. 
So um, yeah, there you go. So the next question, I think, I, I think I know where you might go with this. Um, <laughs> so the next question is, if you could take any character from comics, movies, TV, whatever, any character and play that out in real life, who would that be? <laughs> oh man. I think it's Mandalorian, but it may not be. Mandalorian, James Bond. <laughs> um, <Right. laughs> um, Mine is Han Solo. I, I want to be Han Solo. I get to be a smart ass. My best friend's a Wookiee, and I get Princess Leia. It doesn't get much better than pretty, Han Solo. That's pretty dope. <laughs> I'm thinking like Jason Stratham in any of his movies. Hmm. Um, yeah. You know, just just something like that. But like, yeah, just man, just like I don't know, just that dude Han Solo and Chewbacca is pretty. That's strong, dude. That's strong, strong, man. I'm telling you, yeah. who what like Chewie is your best friend, bro? Oh my god! You get, you get the Millennium Falcon, you get Chewie, and you get Princess Leia. <laughs> and, and you know what the great thing about it is? Is he's not the hero. So even if he fucks up, no one really expects much from Han. They're all expected from me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. so it's perfect it's a perfect thing but yeah no um there's so many good ones out there um, yeah and all that so i got one last question for you and this is something that uh there's there's an ongoing battle man it's about a 50 50 split is a hot dog a sandwich i'm gonna go with specifics a hot right. dog is placed in a hot dog bun now, I have eaten a hot dog on bread. Sure, we all have. But it's just, I think a hot dog as itself is just referred to as a hot dog. Um, the device in which you put it into your mouth, I don't think it matters. Um, I do not think it is a sandwich. It's just a hot dog. It's just a hot dog. Yeah. It's just like a uh -huh. hamburger is not a sandwich. No, it's not. It's, it's a hamburger. It goes on a bun. bun. It goes on a bun. Right. That's right. right. And Die Hard is a Christmas movie. I agree 100%. Um, but there's a lot of people that think it's a sandwich and all that. It's what it is. Yeah. So, uh, uh, <laughs> what we're going to do real quick is, is I, I love having you on. And, and, and the cool thing about our brotherhood is um, we talk about this. And in the military, we, we all have a sense of brotherhood, no matter where you served, what branch and all that. But I think if you ask any other branch out there, um, who's most proud? I, they all know that we, they'll all say that we're the best, we're the most professional. I mean, they, they will. I mean, you, you sit down as a SEAL or a Ranger and ask them who's the best, like true, the best branch. Who's, it, they'll say the Marines. They'll, they'll all say it. And then you say, who's the most proud? It's the Marines. Who's the most professional? It's the Marines. So um, we do take that stuff very seriously. One of the cool things about me being involved in this social media thing and this YouTube thing and all that is some of the people that I've gotten to meet and talk to. Um, Ron is one of my favorite people that I've been blessed to been put in my life in the last couple of years. We have a lot of in common. We, we, we like to just hang out. We, we have so many things in common and all of that. More point, he's a really, really good person. Um, so what I want to do is say thank you for being you. Thank you for all that you're doing um, now with Riker and with instruction and being a mentor to a lot of, of kids and a lot of active duty Marines. That's it's amazing. Um, I want to give you a few minutes to talk about maybe Riker USA and some of the stuff that you guys are doing, where they can find you, websites and all that stuff. So, yeah, please take a few minutes and talk about Riker USA. Yeah, hey, guys, go to Riker USA, R-Y-K-E-R-U-S-A dot com. Uh, Instagram, we're Riker USA. Uh, Facebook, Riker USA. YouTube, Riker USA. I'm on Rumble and MeWe, but I haven't really done much with them yet. Uh, I'm really, like, over all of the politics that have infiltrated social media um, that also limit what we can do anyway. But getting back to that, Riker USA, we created the first to market side mounted grip, which you can see right back there over Trey's shoulder. Um, and speed, accuracy, and stability are all improved with this, and it works on everything. Si it, 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 you can side mount to shotgun scars, AKs, AR saws. PCCs, uh, you, you name it, you can put it on there. It comes with a standard Picatinny mount, or you can put a, a direct M-Lock mount on it. We have the Riker Sling that gives the, the grip an amazing assist because of the three strands of uh, Marina grade bungee that are inside that 550 cord wrap that, that Trey's holding up right now. 
Um, it is a two point sling. We have um, a couple of other accessories coming out. Hopefully, if everything works out well, they'll be we'll be releasing them next month. Uh, we will be at the Palmetto State Arms event called the Gathering at the Sawmill in Lawrence, South Carolina, 17 through 19 March. What's up? You going, Scotty Mo? Scotty Mo? Oh yeah, Scott, Scott, my boy Scott Puggett, who runs, who's who's gone completely dark on all social media. Uh, nice. Lucky him. And, uh, but yeah, so we'll be there. So we'll be releasing two, we'll be le releasing the DC mount, which is going to be a, uh, an accessory that goes in between the grip and the mount that allows you to put your light and laser closer to your, to the grip until we have the integrated control option available, which we are working on still. There's a lot of moving parts with that. Um, if you guys want or are interested in our types of fire firearms instructions, you can go to our website, go to the training tab that goes to support. Or you can just hit me up, ron.holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S, at RikerUSA.com, or DM me on Instagram, and we'll start our conversation there. We do everything. Let's say we train soccer moms, the special operators, and everyone in between. Uh, we do everything from pistol, rifle 101, shotgun 101, all the way up to advanced stuff to include uh, some combat casualty care techniques with, in moving a wounded shooter uh, under stress, shoot, move, communicate, critical thinking, critical response. Uh, since April, um, we've been really busy, we've trained over 350 people and, um, over 200 of those have been women, first time shooters, uh, who probably half of that 200 have done follow, continued follow up training with me. So, uh, we do travel to train. We are based in Wilmington, North Carolina, but we do travel to train. You can find us. Um, there's a few places, one place up in Maryland, six, eight training group. Uh, these guys, uh, carry the grip, but they, um, the, the guys who own that company, they're, uh, tactical games competitors and they rock all of our stuff. So they, they will go up there if you want to demo it, if you're in that area. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's kind of it, man. Just hit me up. And, um, and then for everybody's listening and watching this right now, use the code Riker 20, R Y K E R 20 at checkout and, um, get you a little bit more of a discount. And if you get on our email list, Whenever we release new products, you, you have first access to it, and that will always be at a discounted price uh, before we release it out onto the website. Absolutely, and, and, and I love the grip, and I love the sling. The uh, What I love about the sling, I like to keep it tight. I'm, I'm, I'm maybe different. I like to run my slings really tight. But with yeah. the bungee, there is enough movement that you're going to be able to, to get in that pocket. You're going to be able to get everything moved. And it's still going to stay tight, but there's a little bit of movement. But you combine the sling and the grip together, and I tell you what, man, the transitioning and everything about it is is phenomenal. That, you don't ever have to you try to come up on target. Please, I did. A, I put a video, a side by side video, up on our YouTube and our Instagram like two weeks ago, showing yeah. like traditional nylon sling and, and the Riker grip on how fast you can actually come back up on target. So nice. yeah, yeah. No, I'm glad you like it, Trey. I, I appreciate the support. And dude, I, I, I'm excited for our, uh, you know, this relationship and looking forward to uh, getting down to your neck of the woods and doing some training with you and your, in your crew. Yep. Um, and I don't mind coming when it's snowing. I love the snow. Like I'm, I'm like, that's, that's my jam. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for watching this or listening to some podcasts. Uh, go ahead and, and, and smash that thumb. Um, Go follow Ron over at Riker USA on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Do all that awesome stuff. Um, all of this contact information and all that will be in the description below. You'll be able to get a hold of Ron no matter where you are. Uh, once again, thanks, uh, Ron, for coming on. Great, great time. Awesome stories. Thank you for your service. We do appreciate that as, as much as um, anyone could ever imagine. Uh, knowing what you guys went through for 20 years, um, people don't know really what you guys go through. Um, so thank you so much for your service, and we'll see you guys in the next podcast. Semper Fi. Well, guys, thanks so much for listening and watching this episode of the Jarhead Podcast. If you enjoy what you're hearing, make sure you go ahead and give us a follow or a thumbs up, and make sure you go check out our swag store over on our website, ghosttacticalproductions.com. Until next time, stay frosty, simplify.